Hi, it's Charlie Seymour Jr. and I'm here with Bill Yates, who has been a fixture here at Swarthmore Presbyterian Church 39 years. You're about to learn a lot more about Bill Yates, this church, the choir, the music program than you thought possible. So how did Bill first get to this church and become the music director for over 39 years? You wait. It's coming. So Bill, tell me when you first came to Swarthmore Presbyterian Church. Uh, that would be, my first service here was the first Sunday, first Sunday in January of 1969. 1969. Yes, exactly. It's a very good year. I was getting out of high school at that point. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> and tell me, um, y you had some pretty big shoes to fill at that point. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Tell me what it was like here at that point and your predecessor, how long he'd been here. Clearly, I know, but I want to make yeah. sure we have that. All right. Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, John Miller was here for, a, I believe it was a couple of years, and then he went on the road with uh, a well-known singer, I can't recall the name right now, but uh, and Phyllis, his wife, sort of filled in for him. But prior to him, it was Bob Gruders, who was very a uh, real uh, puller in, in the music world here in Philadelphia. He was on the faculty at Temple as a voice teacher, then he directed music here. I'm not sure how many years he was here, but then uh, then he left, I think, somewhere um, maybe 66, 67, but uh, I don't have a handle on that exact date. But uh, It's interesting in the Presbyterian Church for ministers, there's always an interim minister, so yeah. you don't mm -hmm. compare the new one you just no. hire with the previous oh, yeah. one. Right. Maybe that worked to your benefit then, that it, it wasn't going right from uh, Gruder's directly to you. Well, it, yeah, I was never, I, I, I knew Bob and uh, I knew of him, and uh, I came from uh, singing. I was tenor soloist at Bryn Mawr Press and at Wayne Presbyterian, and that uh, came from there here. And uh, actually, Bob Smart, do you remember that name? Yes. He was at uh, Trinity Church here. And uh, I was a soloist at the syn at synagogue where he uh, was organist, and he asked me to come out and do a, a recital here of a Benjamin, Benjamin Britten songs here at Trinity Church. But the accompanist brought me over here to rehearse in the choir room, Loeffler. And I said, it's a beautiful church. I was, I was smitten with the, uh, it was just, it was walked in, it was like an old Scottish kirk, you know. I said, this nice. is really. And he said, uh, uh, are you interested, in, would you be interested in be coming here as music director? I said, what do you mean? He said, he said the job is open. <laughs> And so you'd see no formal announcement. No. You come I, in here to have a rehearsal and somebody yes, mentions it. Said, and so with that, I called and got in touch with Peter Miller. Uh, he was chair he was chair of the of worship or music at that time. I applied and we went through all of the amenities and uh, this maybe took three or four months. And that was the uh, The rest is history. The re as they yes, say. exactly. Right. So it was, it, was, it was just a, a, a coincidence, circumstance. And I would like to think the Holy Spirit had something to do with it. It would but, be nice uh, <laughs> to think that too, yes. What were, what were your duties explained to you at that point? What did you feel you were coming here to do? Well, just to direct music, to uh, uh, to work with the, the, the pastoral staff and establish the, the, direct the choir and the youth choirs, which uh, there were at that time Three, three. I believe yes. We did have a middle school choir. There was no high school choir, and a junior and primary choir. Were and you helping to select hymns at that point too? I, uh, that was uh, that evolved. Evolved. Yes. Uh, I don't know what the the, I don't know what the protocol was before I came, but that that evolved, and uh, so there were, when I came there, were very. Two wonderful interim ministers here. Then They're, they didn't have a full-time uh, uh, pastor. D two gentlemen that just I'm indebted to uh, for making my uh, uh, initial days here at Swarthmore's, and that was uh, uh, Harry Cotton oh. and R Ralph Druckenmiller. I don't know if you recall those names, okay. but they were here until the, uh, they were. The pastoral nominating committee was out looking then, and and of course that 
bought uh, uh, Bert Atwood, Bert Atwood, who came, I believe, about five months after I came here. I pre actually I preceded Bert in coming. So you were already staff. established. Yes, you were already the man yeah. when he came. Yeah. But he was he was my first mentor, and uh, I which I needed badly, and he was really a strong influence in my approach to to uh, church music and looking and searching. He would give me he would give me sermons about six months in advance. Wow! I would give him six months of anthems, and wow. he'd look through them, say, "This is good." I'm not sure about that. Then, but but of course. He came from a vast uh, uh, background, uh, a large church in uh, Gross Point, Michigan, where there were three services, and uh, he was very familiar with the machinations of the music, uh, the church music world, <laughs> and all the uh, possible travails there thereof. And he and he included me in all the planning and the. the and of course, I've been very blessed with with that uh, since then, with Bert and with Barry Shepherd and 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 with Dick, to be able to sit and plan everything together. And it's always been a what a good rapport. I know I've gone in going to music conferences, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, they, Pennsylvania. Listen to me, um, the, the uh, Presbyterian Association of Musicians conferences, of which I went to several in New Mexico and others. And I tell, I describe the uh, the procedures here in planning the worship service, picking the hymns, and they were astounded at how because you don't always find that that good a report that that great report. So I've really been blessed there from every. There's there's never been any. There there were no issues, few issues. Few. <laughs> so you were finding in these conferences that the ministers, the pastors, were taking charge of. What the hymns were going and, to be? Yeah, I think you'll find that in some. I, I don't okay. want to be, uh, you know. So um, it sounds ju judgmental. You know, make that sort of statement. But th here, it was it was a joint effort, and we even said uh, Dick and I would sit down and sing through the hymns. Nice. And and, and his study, have have a good time. It's a good thing he's a good singer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. there were, yeah. So there were a lot of uh, great moments there. We would be t talking about and. Uh, and we would find yeah, I'd have my hymn book, and he would have his, and we would and we'd find we were open at the same hymn, but without that. even speaking wow. as it. And so that that was a, um, you could say a Twilight Zone moment or something. That's right. <laughs> you, you absolutely could. Yeah, but it was uh, against the, against the Holy Spirit. There you go. Yes. After you'd been here for a while, and after you'd been mentored a little bit more into uh -huh. the music yeah. uh, of coming into sacred music. What were you hoping? What were your goals? What did you want to achieve through your music? I'll be quite candid and say that I, I, I shied away from having a definite, definite goals because they, if they go awry, uh, it sort of upsets the apple cart. I, I, I rolled with the punches, and things evolved, and I would see things. I'd go to the conferences. Oh, let's do, you know, the for instance the. Um, the, the the singing of the psalms the the the, 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 the psalter yes that was as a result of going to a, that. a pam conference yes and things like uh, suggesting things that they did such such as uh, having a worship service when we uh, instead of a meeting uh, uh, open the the monthly meetings uh, uh, right. with with a service singing and uh, I think the Christ candle came uh, uh, as a result of that and of course in many of the, the Many of the ideas were not, not didn't originate with me. They originated with the with other other parishes throughout the uh, and I took I took a lot from this church too uh, from not sharing not of my doing sharing the the one of the things that was very exciting to them was the evolution of the Christmas tree yes into the cross. Right. For, uh, and and into the cross and the, to the Easter Sunday f uh, floral cross. We see it behind you now, yes. draped in black here. We're that's something. Like, here that's today. something that the um, the Pam conference members, when I would tell them about it, they said, "Oh, they were they were very excited about yes. it." And they also the um, the combination of the um, 
the, the labyrinth, the memorial gardens, and the Taizé services. They were th those those three things. They were very uh, interested in and quizzed me, and uh, and I'm sure it took. Uh, so it was there, there was a great give and take, and right. and it's uh, it's a wonderful way for uh, to to be to innovate. So as I say. That's why I sort of uh, roll with the punches and that sort of thing. Tell me for a, for a minute more background on yourself. Yeah. When, when you came here, this is not a full-time position. Um, this church doesn't yeah. afford that in so many yes. ways. Right. Tell me what else you were doing at that point. Were you teaching at that I was, point? I was with the Philadelphia Board of Education for 35 years and did a lot of, uh, did, did a lot of musicals. I, stayed, I was directly all Philadelphia High School Opera Workshop. Uh, I sang at Rodef Sholem Synagogue, right. and uh, later when we get into it, one of the big moments for our 100th anniversary that took place there, as, as you might recall. Okay. And uh, those uh, kept me busy. I was, uh, it was like seven days a week, three nights, <laughs> between church, uh, school, teaching school and church and, and synagogue. So, so you came by that gray hair uh, very, very yes, yeah, I mean, exactly, yeah. yes. Right. Okay, yes. that's great. Tell me about the space that we're sitting in right now. When you walked in, you said you were really smitten by it, I think, with yes. your work. <coughs> what did you think about it from a musical standpoint, from a worship standpoint? How did it affect you at that point? Well, it, I immediately saw that the ambiance in here, it was, had, it was, that I, I could just hear what a worship service would sound like and, and in my mind just walking through this door over my left shoulder that's the first time I saw it coming from and it was just sort of breathtaking and and, and it and and you sort of feel that uh, some a, a presence you know yes and uh, and it reeks with history of course right. And the the stained glass windows, and I I've seen them all evolve and uh, uh, be cleaned and uh, uh, protected from the outside. Yes, right. I've, I've seen seen a lot of changes in here, and but the but this was uh, definitely, and and of course had two daughters married here, okay, and four grandchildren baptized here, okay, and uh, so it it. Uh, it is a very special place for me. Heavily invested in this. It seems to me I recall also we had a leak that went right into the organ <laughs> console yes. and we had a, an electronic organ that, mm -hmm. that for a while went into Fellowship yeah. Hall. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to it after that. What happened to that organ console at well, that point? Because we're going to talk more about the organ and the chancel here in a minute. But Well, it's a case of, of one of those things that where misfortune becomes fortunate. <laughs> I'll explain that the, they were in the process of building Fellowship Hall and of course if you recall That's that was nice. all open and there was just a, a, a very small entryway that to go into the chancel from the out, from the outside. outside. The choir had to go out and then this little... I'd forgotten that. Yes and so they wanted to build this, in, this uh, uh, foyer that goes into Fellowship Hall and so they had to tear that down and they put this giant tarp the weather was supposed to be very clear for the week for the weekend. Who knew? But it uh, suddenly, but uh, uh, Mother Nature had other plans, and it was a deluge that just dumped tons of water in on the console. Wow! That was the original console, but we needed a new console anyway. I, I, I might be saying the wrong thing, but <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> your thought was I, that we needed a I new console. Not, I. I don't cause floods. No, you well, no. A lot of things you can control, yeah. but that one you don't. As but as a, I result, know. as a result, the, ins the insurance from the construction people, and got, we had a new console in Austin, Austin, Oregon, who was uh, the, they were the main uh, builders of, of this, of the, of the organ. And we, so it was a, it was a new console, and it was a, uh, it was well done, but they, uh, that was, that was an unfortunate circumstance. So we were without an organ a while because it, it just the, so we had the electronic, the, the electronic, the, all the electronic here. stuff was just com completely uh, yeah. obliterated. And yeah. so, remind me as well. Seems to me I remember that the console that's up there now, 
The, the one before that was turned 90 degrees. It was facing the wall, and had, yeah. we had to use a mirror to look into the mirror to see. Yeah. Well, that, that, the, uh, the different, uh, we used all of those juxtapositions, and it can be done with this console. Okay. It, it's, it's the spaces there so, the, and so that the organist can have his back to the wall facing um, a, across the chancel, have his back to the chancel facing the wall, or uh, facing out. But, yes. but this seemed to work. Okay. That was, uh, which will, that that uh, logistical nightmare was something that led to our our current uh, uh, we're going transition. Now. Yes. Yes. And, and we're we're coming on that too. Okay. I do promise we're getting there too. That's all right. So everybody who's waiting to uh, to hear that we're we're going to get there. Tell me about in this space. In this sacred hall. Um, yep. You've already given some of your own family background. I yep. was married here, and yep. my daughter was baptized here, and my grandson was baptized. Mm -hmm. So uh, I understand that. Um, tell me some of your fondest memories in here from a musical standpoint. You were involved with so many different oh, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a few to prompt you if, you're, if you don't remember some of those or, or whether they're my favorites and not yours. But you were with the chancel choir, you were with instrumentalists, you were with productions that took over the entire sanctuary. You have some fond memories, I'm sure. Oh, musical memories. Yeah, there, are, there are many, probably too many. The, I, 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 of course, all of the, the things that, that you and I collaborated on, uh, uh, Amal, Amal and the Night Visitors. And uh, Amal and the Night Visitors, and uh, all of the cantatas that the, the, the kids we did. Also, yes. I, I particularly call one that I that really was that uh, uh, epitomizes uh, the 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 way it fit, and that was the tale of the three trees. Oh yes, uh, uh, pardon me. Yeah. And uh, that was, oh, there are others though. I mean, there there was as I say, too many. To mention, and you, and you know all all of those. Well, let's make sure that everybody that gets to watch this video knows a few of those. So, Amal mm -hmm. and the Night Visitors, I know for about 12 years I was yes. involved with yep. Amal here and then up at the college because you yes. did that as well for uh -huh. the town pageant. You were the music director for that. Uh, oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, well. yeah. So, Amal took over. We had um, a boy from New York, and you can tell yes. me how you started with that. And then the mother sometimes was from the church and sometimes brought in. Why don't you talk about a mall for just a minute? Well, let's see. We had we had two or th three local mothers. M most of the mothers were were, were local. And local uh, as in Philadelphia area. Philadelphia area, not yes. Just this church. We you, we there was only one boy that I that I recall having um, sort of tutored in the role, uh, and but the others came from. Usually the Met School in New York. Okay. And uh, I'm sure you recall one particular one that uh, that was Adam Guttel. Okay. He he wrote that musical uh, from the from the piazza. Oh, was that right? He wrote that. Adam Guttel as an adult. Yes. Oh no, I didn't know that. He was a 12 year old, and his his mother was Mary Rogers. Oh, R I don't think I knew that connection. Wow. But Richard Rogers' yes. daughter. Yes. So he's Rich Adam was Richard Rogers' grandson. Wow. And so he came by at Nashville. He wrote from a piazza, and, and uh, we were having a rehearsal here. And uh, she was sitting over in uh, over there and following the score. And I said, "Are you a musician?" And she says, "Oh, she said, oh yes, I wrote a musical." I said, "Really?" What? And she said, "It was Once Upon a Mattress." Wow, <laughs> I know that so one. We, and that story went over my head. I said, "I was too involved with what was going on." So finally. But they spent the night with Jan and me, picked them up down 30th Street Station, and, to, and what, a, what a wonderful experience that was with them. And of course, so many, so many of the young kids from uh, the Met School that came down uh, stayed at our house, and, and they always came with their mother. Yep. And uh, th those were those were fond memories. And, and we had uh, platforms set up, and uh -huh. we had a little bit of a backdrop, and the mm -hmm. organ was yes. playing, mm -hmm. and everybody was coming down the aisle, and we used the entire, mm -hmm. and the whole community was involved of coming oh, to yes, watch, that, right. and that was really important. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mary Ellen Clark, Ma oh, Mary and, Ellen. and Martine Johnson. Ma Mary and Martine, yes. as I say, the local, I was going to get around to, to yes. them, uh, and uh, I surprised, uh, 
Yeah, Mary Ellen did it for, for several, several, several. She several also years. did it when over at the high school, Swarthmore High School, uh -huh. when I was, I'm, I think it was ninth grade, yeah. uh, and I sang One of the Kings at that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to watch that development. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going from a ninth grader to directing her. Yeah. That was an interesting juxtaposition. And how about the Kings? Because you certainly played that a lot of years. Who are some are of you, the Kings? Are you, are you going to mention my difficulty with the uh, the, the box? I am song. not going to mention. This is my box. I mean, that was one of the the big moments here. It's a wonderful uh, part of that music I, as well. I never could get those stones. Uh, uh, one lapis lazuli. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And who were some of the other kings that you played with that you that you're remembering? Uh, here. They, here. It was mostly it was the Ed Ed Heller. Right. Uh, did always did Melchior. Yes. Uh, Balthazar. Who did Balthazar? Was it well, was it Andrew? I think Andrew did it. Andrew a, did it a couple times. Uh huh. Yeah. And then we brought in a Balthazar uh, once, or uh, once, or uh, twice. Uh, okay. I think Dick Babbitt once from Wayne. He was, okay. We we were uh, we were co-soloists at Wayne Presbyterian, and uh, those I have to start really. Uh, that that goes back a few years. It does go back a few <laughs> years. Yes, I've earned this bald head as well as you've earned your gray hair. Yeah. Uh, I loved as well that the community was so involved in coming they in were, and, mm -hmm. and to bring yes. people inside this church for them yeah. to get a sense at that Christmas time of what we're all about and coming in. I think was an important time for the church. Oh yes, and, and community-wise, uh, I I was all it was always uh, on Christmas Eve. At that, at 11 o'clock, when it was time to start that, and I was sat in the narthex, and uh, and I guess I would say, who are these people? I've never seen them before. <laughs> right. And uh, we do with, fill the place the, up on Christmas Eve. Oh, and and the community just uh, it's all it's standing room only on, uh, and it's the the community r really looked forward to to being. To, to being here on uh, on Christmas Eve. So we were fairly fun. tight in the space there. We'll talk about some of the changes yeah. that are coming. Tell me as well about instrumentalists with the chancel choir. Seems to me you're the one that started that. Yeah, we had um, this began, I suppose, during. Um, I know that Bert had spoken of it, it having taken place in uh, uh, in Detroit in Gross Point. But at that point, I was still finding my own way. And then with Barry, we started doing uh, choral works, and finally major choral works for um, uh, one during Advent and one during Lent. Yes. And this really was taking hold and being a be became a tradition, I think, in the in the early 90s, and uh, a lot of. Too many to, to mention. Highlights for me were the Rudder Gloria, the uh, the Dvorak D Major Mass, oh. and several several settings of the Gloria, several several settings of the Magnificat, and several masses in in the spring. And uh, and they were those were always uh, a highlight for me. And uh, I suppose the the most memorable time was that during our celebration on the 100th anniversary, that would be in 95. Okay. Uh, we did, uh, we had a celebration of Psalms and joined with uh, uh, the choir at the synagogue, Rhoda Sholem, they were celebrating, their, we were celebrating our 100th, Rhoda Sholem was celebrating their 200th, and Old Christ Church. Uh, down in the old town was celebrating the 300th. So the three choirs combined with the Germantown Presbyterian Church Choir and I I conducted it and worked with Tom Whittemore who was organist at uh, Rhoda Sholem and we did about t maybe 12 settings of Psalms, all the, everything from uh, Palestrina to um, Charles Ives. <laughs> mm. there, there were, it was a really an eclectic uh, and they even advertise it at the top of the uh, Pico building. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, they been going about 100th anniversary Swarthmore Presbyterian Church, 200th Rudolf Sholem, 300th Old Christ Church, 
celebration of Psalms. Uh, that was you could see that on Friday night while we were going down the big crowd. It was. And what else did we do that year? Well, Matt Glandorf, who was one of, one of the organists, wrote a setting of the uh, statement of faith of what year? Is it '72? When the North and the South combined. Okay. Uh, and uh, the date escapes me. But he took the uh, and we commissioned him to write uh, work. And then we also had a um, a an, an organ fest with four. Paul Bourdignon was uh, organist at that time, and they brought back Matt came back, and Larry Molinaro came back, yes. and and David Lowry came back, and so the four four of them did an organ fest uh, of uh, hymns, uh, uh, variations on hymns, and we would sing, and they would play, they would play a number, then they would do their thing, their, the the way they would uh, do hymns. It was a very exciting time. You've had quite a few organists that came from Curtis. Yeah. Were, you were Curtis as well, is that? Yes, I graduated from Curtis in uh, 1960, and uh, my classmate of mine was John Weaver, who was uh, who became, who took, uh, um, oh my, I'll think of it. Okay. But anyway, he became head of the organ department there. He probably sits in interviews like this and says that Bill Yates was one of his no. classmates. So <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, but at any rate, uh, he had, he wanted, he wanted his organist to have an opportunity to have to develop in hymn playing and uh, and and church literature because it's something that didn't get at Curtis. So we we renewed our friendship and he sort of sent, kept sending me every two years uh, some of his better pupils and uh, that was we were blessed with a whole string of uh, the, those four that I mentioned yes. uh, plus R R Rick Elliott uh, oh, yes. who was. Uh, Principal organist now at the Mormon Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. He was here for two years. Mm -hmm. So there, there were, there were so many. And you also had a young whippersnapper named Burton Tidwell. At one yes, point. and I was talking about, about Burton. Him, but yes, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, he was here for uh, t t two. Uh, he did two sessions here. Two different times. Yes. He didn't learn it well enough the first time. He had to come back and repeat what he was doing. But and he, of course, is the one who's designing and installing the new organ that oh, we're, oh, yes. we're, we're talking about. I'm, here. I'm d d delighted about that. He knows the instrument. He he knows the its its shortcomings, and he knows what the, what needs to be done. And and he, it will be done right because he'll be doing the organ for the church and not for himself, uh, which is always always good. And he's. He's an organist and, a, and, and an organ builder, and he's got quite a reputation around the country too. So it's that's, oh yes, absolutely. I'm I'm happy that I'm happy to see that he's he's the one the church chose to uh, to do this. What did it feel like when you're inviting all these top quality organists, and the organ is probably starting to go downhill? It didn't just one day stop and go downhill. Yeah. Well, we did, did we did it? have one rebuilding period, you okay. know, in '79. It was, I wrote uh, sort of a proposition that this, uh, some things that sh could and should be done. And the session took it up, and then there was a, a, a generous, uh, at that time, anonymous donor. I don't think it would hurt to, to, for the people to know that it was the, the Walkers. Okay. You know, Bob Walker was, he was on the art history staff at the. Swarthmore so College, okay. and they were both in the choir, and so they came up with a, a generous donation and asked that they may be matched, which it was. So there was a, uh, a very uh, substantial renovation of the organ, and Rick Elliott played the uh, dedicatory recital in 1979. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that on that okay. uh, that date, but nothing it, with the with the exception of addition of uh, Walker Tektronics, it added some uh, uh, electronic stops, uh, ch the, the chimes, the bells, uh, those big 32-foot, yeah. they, that they're, they're better than real, okay. uh, the electronic ones, okay. and a, a couple of trumpet stops, but those, those, that was done in 90, I want to say 96. Six or about 97. So here we are in 2012, and we're yep. about to have the chancel taken down, the yep. organ removed, yes. the new organ, a new mm -hmm. chancel built. But 
for years, I know when you and I did different things in here, uh -huh. for years you talked about things that you wanted to see yes. done here in the space. Talk to me a little bit about some of those changes that you had wanted over the years that you thought would improve the musical feel out here in the congregation. Well, I, I, I in meeting with personnel and uh, going to all these conferences, it was a reality check, and I knew that, that this was coming. Organists, there weren't as many people, organists going to Curtis or going anywhere. So for the church to maintain its level of, uh, a, a, a competent level of, of music and, uh, and talent, <clears throat> I knew that this was a logistical nightmare, <clears throat> pardon me, that we had there. They needed to have the the console in a place where one person, so that both jobs could be organist and music could be in one, as it was in most of the churches yes. in the area where you, the organist can sit there and conduct from the console, which he can't do, could not under this circumstances. So I always advocated we had to to reconfigure the chancel to to do that, and uh, I knew that would be possibly a. a a hard sell, so mm -hmm. I started making it a soft sell. <laughs> yes, and uh, and by sure uh, pointing out the facts of, the, of having a reality check, and they they started to get the idea <clears throat> that uh, the organ console needed to be moved, and so that one person could do both, and the choir could see them. So moving moving mm -hmm. the, the console is certainly one. Uh, I, and there were other things that I brought from these conferences that I could see were were sort of a a, a hindrance here. The the it, it, I was never more uh, aware of what our focus on the word uh, water uh, the cup. Yes. And. All three of those things have some, uh, I think, some disadvantages here. I, I think that the pulpit, I, I said the pulpit needs to be out more into the congregation. Right. People in the north, in the big transept, can't see the communion so table. moving it from over They can't over see the, the communion table. Right. They can't see the communion. And then right. when we have baptisms, people past the third row can't see what's going on, can, yes. cannot see the baptisms. Right. So, uh, and I'd seen some designs of churches of of, of naves uh, that were similar to to this, both in size and in uh, ambiance, uh, and uh, and they had brought the the chancel area out farther into the congregation, which would make uh, possible to move the console right. to where the communion table is now, right. and the communion table out into the congregation farther into the congregation. Uh, and even I could see having a maybe a a, a, a movable bap, uh, a baptismal, a baptismal font, font right. that could be moved from the rear of the church and the rear of the church front and uh, and up onto a a raised uh, uh, chancel area where people could see and uh, it just uh, and with no uh, compromise to the uh, to what, what the congregants are used to seeing, as far as the the uh, the, the worship experience, the, 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 the and the and and the, and the chancel and the, and the itself, there was no, nothing would would there were no drastic changes really, no no stark uh, uh, startling startling changes. So as I'm sure you know, all those things you were just talking about will be happening here in oh, this yes. whole modification. Oh, I've seen the plants. And they're Tell really me as beautiful. well, because this is the one that stands out for me uh -huh. from you, is the plaster that's up uh -huh. and around yeah. here in the arch oh, yeah. that you've always wanted to have removed, which will be... Tell me about that. Your feeling yeah. is that for the acoustics, it's keeping it back in there and bouncing? Well, you see the area around the... the, the, the um, the facade, the organ, yes. the, you see that area around there, the right. white area, that used to be plaster. Well, yes, we used to be solid that, that in used there. To be solid plaster. That was one of the things that I, that, that, that I read, they did take it out, right. was able to do that. And, was uh, that the 79 change you're talking that about? That was a 79 change, okay. yes. Okay. Actually, Mark Brumball was organist, and his brother is a famous organ builder, was organist then, and we got in here, came in here one night, 
without permission. Uh oh. We, <laughs> we didn't take this through session, by uh -oh. the way. We, we took, took all. The, you remember the old organ, the old gold pipe facade that yes, was there? They, they, do. they were non-functional right. pipes. They they were just so. So, so we just said, hey, let's take them down. Nice. <laughs> and open up the open up that space, which we did. And. Uh, you troublemaker, you. I know, and the people were a very well-known uh, congregant here, uh, uh, Lynn Kepax, yes. was was looking at the with that. Uh, imagine that area up there open, just right. an open. Yes. And uh, it was about the time the movie Jaws was coming out. Okay. And you remember how Jaws was advertised with this? Uh, yes. <laughs> and he says, hey, "That looks like a Jaws." Yes, there it is. <laughs> and he would. He would. He was doing it jokingly, but um, so we left it down. And uh, the when the organ was redone, these were all the, the, these were all functional. These were functional, and those those were additions. When that uh, when we had the new uh, when we had that uh, redesigned organ in '79, this came about. They also used to be able behind those there that was where the swell organ was and so you could see the shutters opening and closing oh, I, did, I do remember that yeah, yes. yeah, constantly so they they changed the divisions they put the swell organ down in the hole pardon the expression yes uh, and then the great uh, the great became a completely open division okay. and all the expression was on the swell which was down and the shutter doors down there so behind there 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 is no there is there, there are no swell shutters or no enclosures, and uh, that was the uh, the outcome of that particular thing. And, and how about the plaster that's out here further? We've got the angels coming yes. out, and now the plaster out here. I, I could never convince them to take that down. I, I, I it's thought, coming down now. Oh, good. Well, it's coming out. I, I didn't want to press my luck. I said, yes. I said, be, and uh, but there was a lot that had to do with the with the lighting of the chancel area because. If they did, some of those lights would would be shining through. So, right. I said, I won't press my luck. We'll that, that uh, I'll I'll save that battle for another day. Well, you know Ken Hull, and he's yes. very much involved with what's yeah. going on here uh -huh. now, and is really looking after the lighting. I've been yeah. in a number of those meetings, and he's yeah. really take. So, uh -huh. I think you'll be thrilled with that. Uh, so, let me um, finish up here with what do you feel that people in the pews will experience? with this change of the chancel, with the change of the organ. What are some of your hopes of things that they will see and, and will get a different Pardon sense me. of? Pardon me. Uh, I hope, and, it, the, the, and it's the ultimate, I think the ultimate uh, desire of all people who lead worship, who have a part in, in, in leading the worship, that they feel more uh, in, included, a, a part of, Apart and closer to to what's happening, and by bringing all these things out, I think the congregants will will feel the uh, more as a, a part a, a part of, of of what's happening. I think you'll see uh, an increase in in the enthusiasm, and in the and the uh, and the participation. Yes, and. Uh, I, I think the, those those are the things that are that are that are uh, sort of intangible when you when you're planning, but it it does it, but they play a strong role and and people I think coming in they're already when you come in you can't help but be drawn to this to this room this this place this space, and the acoustics have always been the bane of. My the only bane of my existence here, <laughs> and and I'm, you know what I'm talking about there. The acoustics are almost non-existent, but I think what they're doing and the, some of the improvements they're making in the surfaces uh, resonate to, to will make the acoustics uh, more. Uh, uh, what am I looking? What we're, I'm Rich looking for a word. Alive. Yes, exactly. Okay. Right. Good. But that is, as I say. That I think is the ultimate of anyone who is, who of anyone who is uh, a part of worship leadership, from the singers, the, the pastors, the singers, the music directors, the people who play, uh, is is to to make the the congregants, the participants, 
uh, uh, more uh, uh, give, give them, them more presence and what uh, what's what's going on. Well, for your, thir for your 39 years and for the time we've yeah. spent here together, and all the time you and I have spent together yeah. uh, over the years too, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, it's been a pleasure, and I'll always will be. And I'm still a member of this. Uh, uh, Jan and I are still members of this congregation, and uh, uh, and we are charter members of the Memorial Garden. There you go. <laughs> so so you know where. Uh, where we can find you uh, at, some uh, at some point. At some point, exactly. Yes, right. God love you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Charlie.